It's my pleasure to introduce our next guest from AssBio, Senior VP Global Manufacturing, Jason Krentz, and VP Process Development and Preclinical Manufacturing, Dr. Jacob Smith. As a reminder to attendees, if you'd like to ask a question of our speakers, please type it into the question box under the video player, and we will try to ask them on your behalf. The format for this session is a fireside chat. We'll go about 25 minutes, and if there's any time at the end, we'll, we'll try to ask your questions. So with that, let's get started. Uh, Jason, Jacob, thanks so much for joining us today. And maybe to start, Jason, can you describe the history and organization of AskBio's manufacturing, including how you interact with ViralGen? Yeah, sure. Thank, thank you, Kay, for, for hosting us today. Um, AskBio's manufacturing process and our, our capabilities have, have definitely been evolving uh, since the founding of the company starting with an inherent platform and then now transitioning to our, our high producing suspension pro tool pro 10 cell line upon which our, our current platform is based um, using that pro 10 cell process we have multiple aav therapies currently being evaluated in the clinic uh, we've also scaled our process to 2000 liters successfully and in the process of introducing what we call our next generation suspension manufacturing process and we anticipate that leading to volumetric yield increases as of five to up to 10 X, uh, hopefully more, but you know, we like to be a little bit cautious as we talk about this. So, uh, so volumetric increases of, of five to 10 X over our, our current platform. Um, our, our process development and analytical teams uh, where we have significant capabilities are based at our headquarters in, in RTP, North Carolina. And we work very closely with colleagues across ASBIO, but also with our, our colleagues at Viralgen, uh, which is a subsidiary corporation of, of ASBIO and also a TAV, both, both of which are located in San Sebastian, Spain. Uh, we work very closely with them to bring our products to the clinic. Um, today, Viralgen has world-class facilities, seven viral vector manufacturing suites, um, having just recently um, completed construction of and, and finished GMP certification of their newest facility in San Sebastian. Uh, and we're also using capabilities at TAV to manufacture enzymatically produced DNA rather than plasma DNA, uh, which provides certain advantages to us. Okay, great. And before we dive into manufacturing specifics, can you provide an update on the status of your current product development programs? Yeah, great. I'll I'll, uh, I'll take that one while we're while we're still on. Um, we're, we're currently advancing six programs in the clinic, uh, focused in areas of cardiovascular, neuromuscular, CNS applications, uh, tackling diseases with high amount needs such as Parkinson's disease, multiple system atrophy or MSA, Huntington's disease. Uh, heart failure, pompid disease, and limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And as a CMC and manufacturing organization, um, we're continuing to work with our, our colleagues in therapeutics development to, to move those programs forward in the clinic as we prepare for late stage clinical and future commercial manufacturing. So, so let's focus on what AFC is doing to advance the field of AAV manufacturing. And maybe we'll start, uh, if you could describe the Pro 10 cell line and other things you've learned along the way, either from your own setbacks or others, which is resulting in improved AAV yield capability. Yeah, thanks, Kay. Uh, and thanks to everyone for, for the opportunity to be here today. I'll I'll take that question. Um, so as Jason mentioned, the, the ProTen cell line was developed to transition from an adherent-based system to a, a suspension-adapted, chemically-defined um, manufacturing platform, which continues to utilize the, the triple transient transfection. Um, I think one of our key benefits is that we've been working in this in this space and we've had the, a long history of working in, in this particular background. So the, the cell line itself was isolated, uh, single cell cloned and, and expanded from um, looking at, at, at production attributes, productivity, transduction efficiency, from the very beginning. Um, throughout that time, we've we've had the opportunity to go through multiple iterations and, and update cycles to both the process and the analytical technologies. Um, a lot of that development has come from working in-house, but also being flexible and responsive to applicable feedback and, and guidance that we've received from health authorities around us. Um, I, I would say one, you know, one thing that I think has allowed us to continue to move forward is that we've maintained a focus on uh, incremental process improvements to productivity and and re reduction of the cost of goods for manufacturing. Um, 
you know, those are the things that we can expect to see process intensification, improvement and, and novel analytics to, to enhance our, our upstream modeling. Upstream's historically been a black box, I think, for all manufacturing platforms of AAV. And there's a lot of different AAV platforms out there. So, you know, taking a step back and focusing on our technological background and, and trying to advance programs in the context of our own system, uh, both process and attribute focused, then we, we feel, you know, we can continue to move products forward. The longer improvements, the, the more broad brushstroke improvements, things like the incorporation of a stable transformed cell line, I think we can expect to see some of those come along the, down, down further down the road. Um, and, and optimizing and, and adapting that robust platform to be able to accommodate, accommodate a variety of capsids and therapeutic cassettes that, that come into the platform over time, we can expect to, to have more experience generating production data at scale. Um, we can also expect to see experience with our products in global markets further validating that, that technology as a platform. And what are you doing with CAPS at design to improve tropism, you know, trans, transduction efficiency, safety, immunogenicity? So CAPS certainly plays a, a role of that of those target molecular features that we would we would go after in designing a new product. And um, you know, I think one thing AskBio does bring to the table is that we we have all of those sort of components of of product design. Uh, integrated in, into one company. And, and um, you know, I think our approach has been to both to, to chase iterative and rationally designed chimeric capsids along with library screening efforts. Um, but I think really, again, here, it, it goes back to having, having a, a uh, procedural or a, a robust process for fitting all of those components together. Uh, so having a robust model for screening and down selection with an emphasis on manufacturability in addition to transduction efficiency and target tropism uh, in conjunction with selection of those different transgene constructs through development and optimization, um, along with other target molecular features like route of administration and, and, de and dedicated or, or um, designated indication. Uh, I think is is really what allows us to kind of bring all of those pieces together and and design good products. So with that, is is a hybrid design where you maybe take the the best attributes of of different um, capsids to combine into something new? Maybe the the best approach there, or is there something more out of the box that that could be promised? I think it depends on on really what you're looking for. Um, you know, again, I think it makes sense to to establish some early version of those target molecular features or target product profile early on in development. Um, you know, I think you can you can certainly develop capsids to or screen capsids or or if, you know, for example, a library screening approach. You can you can pursue capsid development uh, with a reporter vector. Um, however, you may, you know, you get what you select for in that case. And so I think at some point, the the iteration of those products does need to come together, and then it needs to be coupled with, with your desired manufacturing system. Okay. And, and another area where you're really leading the field is your use of uh, enzymatic DNA. Uh, some might recognize it as under the term doggy bone DNA, but tell us more about that. Yes, so I think I think folks are familiar that uh, TAV or TAV Biomanufacturing Solutions, they use the full name, which is a subsidiary of ASBIO, uh, manufactures enzymatic DNA to support uh, recombinant AAD programs. So we're working closely with TAV uh, to introduce uh, enzymatic DNA in our programs. Um, and you know, what we're focused on here is first and foremost is it you know improving the, um, the quality of the product. Right, so with with the enzymatic manufacturing process, we can eliminate uh, the microbial uh, processing portion of the amplification. So then we're able to amplify our desired sequences chemically, and we can eliminate that um, the potential uh, inclusion of the bacterial propagation elements that we would see from plasma DNA. Um, we're also able to to reliably amplify uh, complex sequences and then characterize that DNA starting material. Um, we've also seen in our hands that with enzymatic DNA, we use quite a bit less uh, total DNA in our in our uh, platform process, up to, to one to three times less total DNA 
um, in our transient transfection process. And that, you know, coupled with um, the improved attributes of the product, that should improve both the uh, the quality and and lower the cost of the product that we see as we move forward into commercialization. Um, the other piece that's really important is that with this enzymatic process, we're able to amplify gram quantities of DNA in very short processing times. So when we think about supply reliability, that's an important aspect of what we're doing. So can you describe any performance breakthroughs that you recently achieved with your enzymatic DNA? Yeah, so um, as, as Jason alluded to, I think the one of the key breakthroughs that we've seen is that through construct-specific optimization uh, in the upstream space, along with enhanced analytics and, and understanding of the, the product packaging and, 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 um, and genome integrity, we, we have been able to reduce quite significantly the, the amount of total DNA. And, uh, you know, I think to, to maybe speak to that from a slightly different perspective, you know, the, the plasmid carries not only the, the target genetic sequence, but it also carries the backbone, which plasmid is, is and doggy bone and other DNA-based starting materials, substrates are, are ordered on a per gram basis. And so uh, that gram quantity is, is going to, whether it's a plasmid, it's going to carry that additional copy of the backbone along with with it. And so uh, on a gram per gram basis, doggy bone actually, or the, the enzymatic DNA actually does stretch itself a bit further. Um, so we've been able to reduce the total DNA through, through upstream optimization. But in addition to that, we see that sort of construct per construct, gram per gram advantage. Um, on, the, on the downstream side of things, I believe we've, you know, through that upstream optimization, we've also seen uh, that the, you know, the, the, the adage of, of garbage in, garbage out, right? So as we, as we boost productivity and we, we see um, higher genome integrity and better packaging coming out of the reactor, we see more improvements on the downstream through, through enrichment of those, those full genome-containing capsids. Okay, so on the flip side, what are some of the remaining challenges associated with enzymatic DNA you're trying to solve? So I, I think the the biggest one is that it's it's a structurally distinct molecule from plasmid, um, and and that those things require development. Um, you know, plasmid, sort so to speak, has been proven. It's been used for for a really long time in in screening and and evaluation, and it, and you know, enzymatic DNA offers that same flexibility. Uh, but scale up and the transfection cocktail historically those were uh, I think the, the biggest hurdle for plasmid-based production systems and production platforms. Um, I believe the, that a number of, of groups, including ourselves, have been able to overcome the, the large-scale transfection component. Um, however, we're, you know, we're learning that, that this requires additional characterization and additional optimization uh, of those individual construct ratios, the total DNA to the transfection reagent of choice. Um, so the the enzy basically the enzymatic DNA really needs to be evaluated in in the context of of the end user's platform uh, rather than taking you know standard transient transfection conditions that would have been established for for a plasmid DNA starting materials and and then plug and play. Um, it's still very much plug and play into your system, but uh, using your own platform as a, as a guide for for platform fit. So, so give us a sense of, you know, <clears throat> where we're at in terms of advancing this technology from, from just a science project to, mm -hmm. you know, understanding how far along development of enzymatic DNA-based uh, gene therapy products uh, are today. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, I think we've come a long way in a very short period of time. Um, you know, as Jacob mentioned earlier, and we talked about a next generation manufacturing process. So that uh, enzymatic DNA is core to that to that new platform for us. So we're in the process of introducing that um, that technology with with all of our products. Um, and we can give you one specific example that um, that that we've announced at the end of last year. Our Huntington's disease program, which recently entered the clinic, uh, is actually utilizing enzymatic DNA. So we have we have a great example of a 
a clinical stage product with an IND that's been accepted and is moving forward in the clinic. So uh, stay tuned. You'll, you'll soon hear more stories from us like that and, and hopefully others along the way. Okay, well, great. Uh, well, let's switch to the downstream side and I guess maybe more generally then we'll get to enzymatic, but what are you currently focused on uh, to improve purity potency of the, of the finished product? So I think this starts with an improved understanding of, of our product attributes. You know, we've, if, if you look historically at, at everyone in the space, we've, you know, we've fortunately been able to move products forward and, and, and certainly with, with sufficient analytics to, to release and approve uh, a few products to the market. Um, but as we advance the space, as we advance the processes, uh, we need to focus on on that process control and, and those intermediates that are generated in in the multitude of different platforms that are being used today. Uh, I think one particular example where we've we've really innovated and, and di differentiated our product understanding is is through a, a novel empty full um, partitioning method. So we would um, without improved analytics, it would have been very challenging to to uh, condition and and um, equilibrate the the unit operation for for empty full separation and chromatography to partition empty capsids away from binding, um, but it gives us a cleaner substrate coming off of the column. We you know we have better understanding of the intermediates that are binding and eluding, um, and as as characterization techniques you know further advance in development, I think what we we hope to do is is look back at some of those subtleties that we may observe as we have products moving to, to clinical stages. And, and when we see subtle differences in clinical efficacy, we can perhaps link those back to potential analytical or attribute differences that are observed in the process so that we can you know, further control what we're producing and, and, and releasing. And using an enzymatic-based product, you know, how does that change uh, what you're really trying to hone in on in terms of the uh, critical quality attributes with your with your analytics? Yeah, I think for for us, we've you know we've standardized transitioning to the enzymatic DNA as a part of our platform. Um, so I think that's really the first step. You know, transient transfection is at the end of the day a bit of a math problem. Still, you know, we're we're not starting with a stably transformed starting material. We're we're making that as we're starting the bioreactor and then adding that starting material into the reactor. And um, so, you know, moving to less uh, extraneous materials as a part of the starting material, I think gives us a bit more control going in. So, you know, we certainly expect that that the, you know, the enzymatic DNA, um, it should improve that pharmacological profile. Um, we by reducing some of those residual contaminants going in. Um, as I mentioned before, um, you know, we hope to, to see further efficiencies in, in transfection efficiency and standardization of transfection um, so that when we are purifying and enriching for full genome containing capsids, we have a better understanding of it. And I think as, as additional techniques evolve, such as you know, sequencing technologies, I think that'll further shed light on on some of those intermediates that are being generated. Yeah, so I guess at least for the next question, you know, in terms of the analytics, you know, are there technologies that are, you know, coming on board here that are really helping with that, um, that you're evaluating now that you would expect to uh, become, you know, standard? I, I, you know, just a couple of years ago, DDPCR, people were starting to evaluate that and the, the cost benefit. So, you know, where where is that now in terms of standard and other perhaps other uh, next gen sequencing uh, techniques? Yeah, I, I think we're we're definitely seeing some analytics become more standard. Um, you know, DDPCR, the the droplet digital PCR is is certainly uh, emerging in this space. I think we're seeing that um, in you know in the public domain from uh, from publications coming from health authorities. As well as our our own interactions through through feedback and and uh, you know we've been encouraged to move forward with the development early on development of transgene targeting um, vector genome per mil titration methods uh, 
but they also continue, you know, we've been, we've been encouraged to continue to trend that against other strength analytics, um, like the ITR targeting um, methods and, and, um, and, and trying to understand how uh, differences in those uh, against um, other purity methods like full, empty, intermediate determination, um, like AUC or cryo TEM or other methods to, to understand your, your full capsids distribution um, may arise from genome, from genome heterogeneity uh, or, or fragmentation produced early on in the process. Um, further down from that, next generation sequencing, uh, I think you know, common, commonly referred to as, as next gen sequencing now, um, is well on its way. Um, I think everyone is, is, is generating a lot of data with these methods now. Um, but you know, at least from, from our perspective, I think it makes sense to, to take a step back, understand how the methods are, are performing. So you know, for example, the library preparation uh, in conjunction with, with establishing robust controls connected to intermediates that we think might be being produced early on in the process or or residual contaminants that would be you know, co-purifying and moving along with the product, that's going to add the credibility to those data. Having a better understanding of, of the method and, and knowing and expecting the data that are to be produced, from there, we can start making process decisions based on understanding of, of those product intermediates generated in the process. Okay. Um, you know, lately, we've heard a lot of talk about AI. Um, how, how are you guys potentially starting to evaluate where AI could in, lead to improved efficiencies in the near future at your facilities? And again, I'm not talking about, you know, using a, a dedicated robotic arm or something like that, but, yeah. you know, an AI app that, you know, probably yet to be developed, but could improve efficiencies. Yeah, I think it's it's pretty early. I think the first time I logged into chat GPT was uh, about four months ago. So we've got uh but that doesn't mean that it that it, it isn't already out there and in, in wide use. I think we'll definitely see it emerge and uh and help with digitization and, and automation of manufacturing and support activities. And I can definitely see its application in uh you know analysis of large data sets, not just reducing time and resources, but you know, hopefully helping, you know, give us better insights on what may now appear to be disparate data sets. You know, coming from material and process attributes, uh, clinical outcomes, uh, and, and other considerations that we aren't able to incorporate at this time. Um, you mentioned next gen sequencing earlier. I think you know now we're we're almost brute forcing uh, a lot of the bioinformatics work there. So I could see AI is uh, and tools developed based on AI is helping us move forward um, as we implement uh, improved analytical techniques. And we could certainly think about machine learning techniques. Um, Talking about process control, combining sort of inline analytics and historical data sets, but I think um, you know one of the challenges will be validating those applications. So I would see it more as a as a as an offline tool that we're we're using to help rather than a, you know a direct uh, direct uh, you know usage in biomanufacturing processes at least in the near term. Okay, and you know your your manufacturing facilities is designed to support flexible GMP capacity for AAV manufacturing, not just how you're doing things today, but how things will be done in, in five years, in 10 years. So where do you, where do you view the field um, as moving as we go forward? What do you think will be the biggest changes in the manufacturing landscape five years from now? Well, I, I'll start and then I'll, I'll let Jacob uh, chime in, but I, you know, I think, um, you know, the next five years, uh, we'll, we'll definitely see additional commercial approvals of, of gene therapies that are in the clinic, which will be exciting. Um, you know, but I, I think that we'll see from that some some winners emerge, both in terms of the platform technologies, which are moving forward, uh, and also the, the companies which have um, stable, uh, well-developed manufacturing platforms. So we'll, we'll see some consolidation in the industry over the next five to 10 years for both the platforms that are there, but also the uh, the companies that are that are continuing to move forward. Um, I think we'll also see, and, and when we just think about gene therapies in general, I think we'll continue to see applications for viral uh, vector-based therapies, but we'll also see the emergence of more and more non-viral-based non applications and the manufacturing technologies to support those. And Jacob? Yeah, I, I completely agree with Jason. You know, I think I think we really can expect to to see a consolidation in, in production and analytical technologies. 
Um, you know, right now the the field is subjected to a pretty high degree of of platform chaos. There's a lot of uh, of multiple you know early stage programs that are able to advance through to to clinical stages, even you know through a multitude of different production platforms and 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 different analytics to to release AAV on on top of that. I think you know iteratively, I think comparability exercises you know, as a result of, of all of these different production methods are, are kind of driving us towards establishing standardized analytics and best practices. Um, but as Jason mentioned, we're going to see, you know, top developers emerge with a, with a improved manufacturing capabilities. And, and I think it's very likely that a, a, pro, a production platform um, will, will pull ahead that, you know, that is associated with those. Um, you know what that what that really means. I think in terms of the next five to ten years of of processes, I think we'll continue to see you know a focus uh, at least from Ask Bio's perspective. We're going to continue our focus on incremental gains in in process and in analytical technologies. Um, but in the next ten, I think we're going to see some more substantial improvements, like the incorporation of stable cell lines into production. I think those types of improvements are going to become a lot more mainstream at that point in time. And, and process developers should be focused on on developing production platforms and, and and platform technologies that will be able to accommodate those that have the framework to to drop in new technologies and really you know take us from what is probably more like microgram or, or milligram quantities of, of you know total protein and, and drug product per per liter into those more common um, gram per liter you know quantities of of active product. Okay, well, with that, we've reached the end of our time here, but I want to thank you both so much for joining us today. Thanks, Kay. We, we enjoyed the time with you. Yeah, likewise. Thank you.